A few phrases in this text I want to highlight uh, for you specifically this morning. And one of those phrases then is found in verse number 3. The Bible says of this righteous servant that he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You're familiar with that phrase? If you know much of anything about Isaiah 53, it's there in verse 3 that That this righteous servant would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then a similar idea is given to us then in verse number 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So, So do you see in the text an emphasis on grief and on sorrow? What I'd like to do is to consider with the church this morning the idea of feelings. And specifically, I want to entitle this sermon this way, and that is, He felt that. He felt that. If you recollect, in previous sermons from Isaiah 53, I drew your attention to Hebrews chapter 4, and I want to do that yet again. It's Hebrews chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there, if you would, please. Verse 15 primarily, but the surrounding verses help us understand these things as well. You remember the book of Hebrews, to give you a little bit of context. The book of Hebrews communicates to us the greatness of the high priest, the Lord Jesus. He is greater than angels. He's greater than Moses. And verse number 14 of Hebrews chapter 4 says, "...seeing then we have a great high priest." that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. In case you don't know who the high priest is, in case you don't know who it is that is greater than Moses and greater than the angels, the writer to the Hebrews makes it plain. He is Jesus, the Son of God. And because of his greatness, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And as a result of this truth in verse number 15, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So I want us to take from verse number 15 this idea that he felt that, and from Isaiah 53 this idea of of how he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 15 of Hebrews 4 says he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So consider with me first of all the idea of how common feelings are. The commonality of your feelings. I mean every human being feels to some degree or another. Now certainly there are people that are physically unhealthy... They may, on a physical level, not be feeling the way that they should be or spiritually unhealthy. And I'll get to some of those aspects in a moment. But, but, but healthy human beings, it is a common thing for us to feel. To feel emotionally, to feel things physically, to feel things spiritually. Uh, feeling is a part of everyday life. In a single day, you might feel tired, but then later energetic. The older you get, the less energetic you may feel. I've experienced that. In a a day, a single day, you might feel in a moment strong. But then later that same day, weak. In In a single day, you might feel really dumb. But then later feel really smart. I mean, some social settings lend to each of those things. Somebody asks you a question, and you're put on the spot, and you don't really know the answer, and they know you don't know the answer, and in that moment you feel dumb. But then a different social setting, there's a conversation taking place and you interject in that conversation with something that's helpful, something that's thought provoking and and they express appreciation for your input and you walk away feeling smart. All in the same day. A person can feel embarrassed or maybe even emboldened. On the same day you feel insignificant or later that day you feel important. You feel sometimes broken inside. But then other times you feel blessed inside. 
I mean, feelings are a part of everyday life. They are common to humans. If on a particular day you go to see your doctor, your doctor might start the conversation with, hey, how do you feel? Or maybe the question is, where does it hurt? And you say, well, I feel it here. Um, Sometimes doctors or medical professionals will ask you to rate your pain on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being the worst pain of your entire life and 1 being, why did you even come to my office at all? (laughs) Rate your pain. If you know the comedian Brian Regan, you know he has a hilarious bit on, on, don't say 8, you know, uh, reserve that for other things. He says, you know, he said 7 in a certain scenario. It's just really fun and funny stuff. But, but that's a part of a, a medical visit, is, is to rate your pain. Where does it hurt? Um, then maybe the medical professional begins to treat you, and they will uh, stick you with something, maybe some kind of medicine or give you some kind of shot, and they'll say something to you like, hey, you're only going to feel this for a second, you know. Um, And then maybe the medicine has kicked in or you have done the therapy and and there's a follow-up session and then they may ask you at that point, okay, you've received the medicine, you've received the treatment, so now, how did it make you feel? They're just trying to analyze where you are physically and so you have to articulate your feelings. I feel more weak than I did before. I feel better now than I did before. I feel like it's helping me. Uh, And and you're articulating these these things. And and medical professionals are interpreting what you're saying by one to ten. How do you feel? And, and, And go ahead and explain to me. Does it hurt here or does it hurt over there? And they poke on this side and nothing. And they poke on this side and you wince and scream. And and of course you're tough. So you you keep the screaming on the inside. But you heard it. Okay. And uh, you just don't feel... You just don't feel this or that. Or maybe you do feel this or that. Maybe later in that very same day, you're talking to somebody and somebody says to you, hey, that hurt my feelings. If you're married and you've been married a while, uh, any length of time really, it doesn't take long before the person you've pledged to love the most might have to say to you, hey, what you did or said has hurt my feelings. So so in a day, you might hurt somebody's feelings, or in that very same day, your feelings might be hurt. So I'm talking physically, doctor's office analogy, but then also relationally or emotionally, we feel a variety of things in a day. Maybe the, the evening is winding down in your day, and you decide to watch television, and so you turn on one of your pastor's favorite shows, which is Shark Tank. And I start to watch the Shark Tank of an evening and I get drawn into the plot, drawn into the product. And the the producers, of course, of these television shows are intentional and deliberate about trying to draw in the viewer. I mean, uh, if you want to have high ratings, you've got to have something compelling. And so I am easily drawn in uh, to to the plot of the pitch. Uh, I'm I'm easily sympathetic to uh, what the inventor or the entrepreneur is trying to pitch to the sharks and at the point where I like the product and I like the presenter and then all of a sudden the sharks decide they're going to invest and they come together you know the the sharks and the entrepreneur they come together on a deal a percentage and uh and then you know the they 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 um they agree and then sometimes they shake hands or they hug and again if I'm drawn into all this stuff it is not unusual for me (laughs) to tear up a little bit (laughs) to tear up just a little bit, and here's why. Because they just received the American dream, you know? They came up with an idea, and they worked hard, and the sharks, the people with money, were impressed, and now, you know, they're gonna get a check for $250,000 for 10% of their company, or whatever it is, you know? And I'm emotionally drawn in, and I feel something in that moment. Maybe you're sick of Shark Tank, so you turn that off, and you decide to turn on an old film And before you know it, you're watching Old Yeller. (laughs) And you're emotional at the end of that. And you feel for that boy whose dog gets rabies and he has to put his dog down. I mean, I cried the first time I watched Old Yeller. I was emotional. I was sucked in. 
You feel these things in a day. You can feel all kinds of things. Feelings are a part of being human. They're common. And healthy feelings are a wonderful thing. Can I tell you God made you to have feelings? At no point do I want you to conclude that this message is a message that tells you you should ignore your feelings or not have feelings or stifle your feelings in some kind of unhealthy way. No, the fact of the matter is God gave you your feelings and feelings that are healthy feelings are a very good thing. They're common. They're to be enjoyed. They're to be stewarded. And again, they are to, to, it, is, it is to be recognized that they were given to you by God. However, feelings can become unhealthy. And I want us to consider the second idea this morning, and that is calloused feelings. Calloused feelings. People do get to a point where they lose their ability to feel. Have you ever been there in a relationship? You ever been there in a physical situation? Uh, in some kind of setting where everybody else is feeling something, but you're not? I know of one particular Christian that on a very regular basis asks the Lord to give them tears. Because other people are moved emotionally, and, and very likely rightly so, and for whatever reason that person has no tears. A preacher that many preachers, uh, good preachers respect is uh, Dr. John R. Rice. And Dr. Rice was often emotional over the lost in his preaching. And I know generations of preachers that followed him that would say, Lord, give me tears for the lost like John R. Rice had. I never got to hear Dr. Rice preach in person. I have heard some of uh, the greats, I think, uh, great preachers preach in person. It's always a privilege uh, to, to have heard them in person. It's a different thing to hear somebody in person than it is to watch a video. But I did watch Dr. John R. Rice preach uh, on a VHS uh, a tape when I was a teenager. Uh, one of the topics he's famous for is the topic of prayer. And I watched a John R. Rice sermon on prayer. And like many of his sermons, in that sermon, Dr. Rice was moved to tears. And sometimes preachers can put on some kind of emotional show, you understand? I didn't ever catch that vibe from Dr. Rice. No, I think he was sincerely burdened over the lost and, and felt uh, heartfelt feelings about one's prayer life. But there comes a point where people are no longer saying, Lord, help me to feel uh, or, or, or help me to have tears, help me to feel these things. I mean, sometimes they stop praying and stop asking for that, and they become so calloused that it begins, a lack of emotion or a lack of feeling begins to define them. They're so unhealthy when it comes to how they feel. They, they lose their ability to feel. There's a variety of things that can cause that. One thing that illustrates this, helpfully at least in my mind, is... Uh, the, the basketball legend Larry Bird. How many of you have heard of Larry Bird? Would you raise your hand? So most of you know him for the Boston Celtics fame and all the championships. However, one thing I know about him, I know him better for the fact that he was the coach of the Indiana Pacers for several seasons. And after coaching the Pacers, uh, we're from Indiana, so it, it means something to us. Uh, maybe if you're not from Indiana, you know, the fact that he coached the Pacers is irrelevant to you. You just think of him as a Celtic superstar. But, but coaching the Pacers, and then he went on to be the, the team's general manager, uh, having a, a high position there in the Pacers for several years. Of course, he is a Hoosier himself, Larry Bird from French Lick, Indiana. Uh, but I remember one particular moment where Larry Bird is coaching the Pacers, and it was an Eastern Conference Finals game against our rival, Brother Souls, the Chicago Bulls. Okay, some of you are from Chicago. And uh, Reggie Miller had a moment in that game, Eastern Conference Finals, where our player, Reggie Miller, uh, and of course Michael Jordan, famous Chicago Bulls player, were guarding each other. They played similar positions, whether small uh, forward or shooting guard. Anyhow, our player, Reggie Miller, decides to, on an inbound play, with the game close and pretty much on the line, Reggie Miller decides to push Michael Jordan out of the way. This is a super famous play. You probably have seen highlights if you're a basketball person. Miller, it's an inbound play. Miller pushes Michael Jordan out of the way, and he runs to the wing. And the guy, whoever it was on the Pacers, inbounds it to Reggie. Reggie hits a three. The place goes bananas. I mean berserk. It's at home. It's in Indiana. Lots of fun, okay? 
Everybody is screaming and excited. Reggie Miller is jumping, propelling himself in the air, and he's fist bumping, and he just pushed the GOAT, the greatest player of all time, to the floor, Michael Jordan. Reggie is thrilled, right? Everybody is expressing feeling except Larry Bird. And Larry Bird is standing there. He's watching his players, and, and you see in the background, the bench is excited, the people in the arena are excited, and Larry Bird is just standing there. Like, stoic? Stone cold in his facial expression? There's a variety of reasons, maybe why, that he was, that he was looking the way he looked in that moment. Maybe it's because he was just composed. Maybe it's because he was comfortable. Uh, or, or maybe it's just that he's casual in that situation because after all, he's been there and done that. It's interesting what the commentators said in that moment. The commentators commented uh, live in the game on Larry Bird's disposition. I mean, it was so uh, uh, odd. I mean, the game is now, you know, a, a winnable game for the Pacers. And, and you've invested so much in coaching these people. Wouldn't you think he'd just be thrilled and and the way that the commentators navigated through all that was, was to say that it seems almost like he's, he's apathetic in that moment. I mean, I think probably it's because he was composed and he was comfortable and he was casual because he's been a Celtic, he's won championships himself. But the commentators went on to use terms I don't recollect specifically, but to just speculate as to why would he have such a disposition. It's almost like he looked apathetic or kind of numb to the situation. Certainly he looked emotionally detached in the situation. Um, and, and maybe that was the right thing for Larry. It's just an illustration to say here's a person who didn't feel the way everybody else around him felt. Um, I'm saying you can get to a point where, where you are feeling things, but for you it might be in an unhealthy way. Physically, your body can become so numb, racked with disease, that you don't feel anything. That's a dangerous place to be. Or emotionally, in a relationship, you've been so hurt and stung and maybe even abused in a relationship that, that emotionally you're dead inside. You feel nothing. Or spiritually, you're so far from God. You used to be close to him. And you can quote James 4, 8, if I draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to me. I, I know I can be as close to God as I want to be, but, but I also know right now I'm as far from him as I've ever been. And on the inside, you feel lifeless. Your feelings can become callous. They can become unhealthy. Thirdly, this morning, I want us to consider the idea of culture and feelings. If you recollect, I said in my sermon last Sunday morning on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, I said that our culture has made a god, an idol, out of their feelings. And so it's important for us as a church to understand the place of our feelings and understand the, the, the potential and propensities that pertain to what we feel. Because our culture is leveraging our feelings against us. The culture knows it can appeal to your feelings. You understand that so much of advertising, uh, you understand retailers, they know they can appeal to your feelings and so, so they're doing it. They want you to follow your feelings. The retailers want you to make an impulsive purchase. Um, whether the purchase is a big ticket item or a small ticket item, they just want to make some money on you. So they, they hope you're following your feelings. And if you go ahead and purchase a big ticket item on impulse and it's something you cannot afford, it ends up where your feelings will lead you into debt. And you'll begin to feel pressure and stress every time the phone rings. You, you impulsively purchase something you can't afford. No wonder you have anxiety. No wonder your cortisol levels are ratcheted up. After all, the retailer packaged the product so well and enticed you and you felt like you wanted to do it and you didn't think about the, the fact in relationship to your finances. You followed your feelings and now you feel like a failure and you're fretting constantly over that financial situation. 
Maybe you impulsively purchased a smaller ticket item. Maybe it was just some food. And it was unhealthy food. It was fun food, you might say. What happens when you do that? So often you find yourself feeling bloated or feeling fat or feeling frustrated. It wasn't a house or a sports car. No, it was just some small thing. And now you've got an evening of intestinal distress. The retailer packaged it well. And you impulsively followed your feelings into that decision. What about our political leaders? We're talking about our culture here. What about our political leaders? I'm telling you, they will often appeal to your feelings. Instead of presenting facts about a particular political issue. No, they appeal to the feelings. And and so they try to draw us in and persuade us to vote for their cause. And what happens is we often end up feeling used for our vote or used for our volunteerism. And sometimes we end up feeling manipulated by by the politicians that lead our land. What about entertainment? Not just retailers or political leaders, but we think about our culture. What what about entertainment? Uh, I'm saying music and movies and social media, they know that they can appeal to your feelings. So much of what is out there under the entertainment category is flesh-centered, whether it's, it's physical, like lust kind of flesh-centered, or it's, it's an appeal to uh, us being angry, or, or responding in relationships in a way that is obnoxious and arrogant and even abusive. I mean, it makes for good entertainment, or so they want us to think. But then it sets a pattern that many of us are influenced by, and then we begin to feel those same kind of bits of anger or bits of lust, and we, we enact that into the relationships around us. They are appealing to our feelings. Um, I did research on the internet about songs that have this emphasis, you know, modern music that, that appeals to our feelings, and I came up with a song entitled Feel This Moment. Some of you might know it, you might be humming the melody in your brain here after I talk about it a little bit, Uh, but it's uh, given to us by two individuals, two singers, Pitbull and Christina Aguilera, and they want, I just want to feel this moment, they say. Here's a suggestion for you. Make sure you don't ever get anything philosophical from anybody named Pitbull, okay? (laughs) Just not a good idea. Just not a good idea. But the culture is emphasizing, follow your feelings. Um, And really, that's what the culture is screaming to us. And they say stuff like, "If if you feel like having sex outside of marriage, follow your feelings. If you feel like aborting a baby, follow your feelings. If you feel that you are attracted to someone of the same sex, The culture says, follow your feelings. If you feel like a different gender, in today's America, they tell you, follow your feelings. Somebody told me yesterday, I heard yesterday the day before, that you can actually now in America get a sex change for free. There's subsidies that are facilitating that. Follow your feelings. If you feel that way, we're going to enable you to follow the feelings. And as I said last Lord's Day morning, again, I say, our culture has made a God out of their feelings. And any culture that makes a God out of their feelings is an extremely weak and vulnerable culture. Drugs and vices that used to be illegal that are are now legal because the culture is clamoring in relationship to, I want to follow my feelings and I feel like escaping into alcohol, or I feel like escaping into some kind of narcotic. By the way, whether it's a prescription drug or it's some kind of illicit street drug, people are clamoring for escapism. And please understand, people don't want the drug for the drug's sake. They want the drug for the feeling's sake. They're chasing a feeling. And our society is is lessening the laws and and as a result facilitating the feeling 
Even on a social level, feeling has become our God. And when I say social level, I'm talking about social issues or things that we define in 21st century America as the social issues. And, and again, the focus is how do you feel? We are now as a society coddling people's emotions um, because we don't want to hurt their feelings. So you cannot use the wrong pronoun because you might hurt their feelings. You might misgender them. And this issue of race or someone's ethnic background, it is now a lightning rod issue. You better describe them ethnically accurate or else you'll hurt their feelings. Oh, you thought I was from that country or, or that geographical area? No, I'm from this one. You got it wrong. How dare you? I'm offended, you know. Even something as simple as saying somebody's name wrong hurts our feelings these days. Uh, my wife has dealt with that most of her life. My wife's name is Britton, like the country. Uh, there was a lady in our church in Muncie, Indiana. We were there eight years at, at Temple Baptist Church and loved those people and, and uh, served them. And they, they ministered to us in so many ways. One of the godly older ladies in the congregation never did hear quite clearly that her name was Britton. Uh, so on, on our last Sunday there, this sweet, godly, wonderful lady, her name is Corrine Aker. Okay, Sister Aker. By the way, I got her name right. It wasn't Akers, just one, okay? Aker. Anyhow, uh, so Sister Corrine comes to my wife, and it's our last Sunday, and we're hugging and tearing up and just feeling a lot of things on the last Sunday after almost a decade together serving the Lord, trying to further the cause of Christ. And Sister Corrine comes to my wife and says, Oh, Brittany, I'm going to miss you. You know, eight years she's calling her Brittany, okay? Eight years. This stuff happens if you have a somewhat unique name. You're used to that as well. But here's the pro. All right. All right, Brother Alan. Alan's common. Carrie, not as much. But yeah. But yeah, you get it. Some of you get it. Here's the thing. Here's the issue with that. Don't take yourself so seriously. So what? They called you the wrong name for eight years. <laughs> uh, uh, we take ourselves way too seriously. Britain was never offended by that. Don't be offended by silly stuff. Again, this idea of, oh, you better say it the right way to me. You better talk the right way to me or else, or else you're going to hurt my feelings. Do you understand the difference between objective pain and subjective pain? You snap somebody's arm, that's objectively painful. But you call them a bad name, it hurts, sure. You call them a word that, that bothers you. You, you, you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words or names will never hurt me. It's not actually true. They do hurt. But subjective pain, you get to determine how long it hurts. Get over it. Don't take yourself so seriously. But our culture says, oh, they better talk to you the right way. And, and we've got to come up with political policies and, and, and social situations that coddle the feelings of people. This is what our culture is promoting. And these are only issues in, in spoiled countries. And we are a spoiled nation. We have had so many blessings and now we're bored. And so now we make, make gods out of our feelings. We have become entitled as a people. We are a self-absorbed people and the culture is, is facilitating all of that. So, so feelings are common, but feelings can be calloused and can become unhealthy. And the culture is trying to make a God out of our feelings. So what would be then the cure to all of this? The fourth idea I want us to consider is Christ and feelings. Christ and our feelings. If you want to maintain healthy feelings, you've got to maintain a close relationship with Christ. Because it's Hebrews 4.15 that says that he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, he felt that. He knows your pain. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities and it says, in all points, tempted like as we are. So when we are tempted to give in to emotionalism, tempted to give in to following the, the carnal impulses, uh, that, that, that are deep within us. I mean, when we're tempted to give in to our feelings, he was tempted, yet without sin. Um, 
to bring up Isaiah 53 again. It's verse number 3 that says that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In other words, he felt that. He felt those sorrows. He felt that grief. Verse 4 of Isaiah 53 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He felt that. All that wounding and bruising and chastising, he felt that. What about Matthew 27, which is a New Testament record of the fulfillment of Isaiah 53? It's verse 39 that explains that people reviled him. It's the idea of hurling verbal insults at him. They called him names. They mocked him. And some of that in specific is recorded in Matthew 27. And much of it very likely is not. But it was, it was verbal abuse, you might say. Reviled him and then even wagging their heads at him. He felt that. Somebody says, well, why is that a big deal? If it's ever happened to you, you know it's a big deal. Somebody looks at you with disdain shakes their head at you. Emotionally, that can impact you. You feel something in that moment. He felt that. Matthew 27, verse 30 says that they spit on him. You ever have somebody do that to you? If you have, you know you have, and you're never gonna, you probably will never forget it. I'm not just talking about somebody talking too fast and a little chunk of something flies. I'm talking about somebody, <laughs> talking about somebody vicious and hateful to you and they cannot attack you in any other way, and the only thing they have left is their saliva, and they deliberately, intentionally gather the saliva in their mouth and then propel it in your direction, and it hits. If that's ever happened to you, you remember. You know the person that did it. You know when it happened, approximately how old you were, what the setting was. They spit on him. He felt that. What about Matthew 4? The Bible says there that he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. Hungry. He felt that. He felt the draw to appease his, his hunger, uh, in a, it, it, the, 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 the hunger that his flesh had. He felt the draw to appease that in a sinful way. That's the whole point of Matthew 4 is Jesus being tempted. Matthew 4, 9, the Bible there records for us that the devil said, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus felt the draw to worship the devil. We feel that. He felt that. A draw to give in to the pressures and the enticements of the world and the flesh and the devil. Jesus felt that. Christ and feelings. I'm telling you this morning that your feelings are not your enemy, but they can become your enemy if you let them become your master. If your feelings are in the driver's seat of your life, your life is a mess, I promise. Your feelings must be regulated. Specifically, they must be regulated by the one who was touched with the feeling of our infirmity but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Don't let feelings become your master. Instead, let the master regulate your feelings. Whatever you're feeling, he's already felt it. Just within the last 24 hours, I felt jealous. And uh, I felt other things that I know are sinful, of course. I'm human, just like you. You feel things. And the way I handle these feelings personally is I, I feel something like jealousy and then I say sometimes out loud, people around me, my family may hear me say stuff like this, my wife hears me for sure. I, I feel something, I'm thinking something, people around me don't even know what I'm feeling or thinking and I out loud will say, stop it James, stop it. Feeling jealous is not only an ungodly feeling, it's also an unproductive feeling. So I rebuke myself. I, I, I know what the scripture says about the dangers of envy 
And I've studied closely the green-eyed monster and how debilitating it can be. And so the scripture is informing my conscience, if you will, and, and the Spirit of God is highlighting what the scripture uh, is teaching. And, and so with those aspects, then I am, I am able to just say to myself, stop it. What a waste of time. What a waste of, of thought. You're feeling that. Now stop it. I'm saying your feelings need to be regulated and they need to be regulated by the master. Why? Why is he the one that gets to regulate my feelings? Well, because he was touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He's been there and done that. He gets it. Oh, and by the way, he's also God. So he regulates everything. But he's not a... He doesn't lack sympathy for his creation. He knows what you're feeling. And so would you let him regulate your feelings? Not only these things, but your feelings need to be regulated by truth. By truth. The truth is, it's time to go to work. You feel like sleeping in? But again, the truth is it's time to go to work or to go to school. So get up and let truth regulate your feelings. The truth is, you can't afford that. So don't buy that. You can't afford that, so don't say that. Because there's consequences that come from saying it. You can't afford the headache that's going to come from the severed relationship, so don't say it. Uh, you, you, you can't afford uh, so many things, and yet you feel them and you do them, but the truth is, you should stop it. The truth is, a man cannot transition into being a woman. So you might feel this or that, uh, no, you, you let your life be regulated by truth. By way of conclusion, go with me to one last passage. I'd like you to see a passage in Ephesians chapter 4. If you recollect last Lord's Day morning, I, I gave you some homework. I said, if you want to figure out how to thrive in a sexualized culture, you should read closely Ephesians 5 and 6. That's what I said. Um, and I, I alluded to aspects of it just quickly, but appropriately it ties in very well uh, this morning as, it, as, as I had mentioned it in the previous sermon. So Ephesians 4, I want you to understand a little bit of the context before I make application, and that is Verse number 17 mentions the Gentiles, and the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And then in verse number 19, the Bible says, Of these individuals that are walking in the vanity of their mind, they are those who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. The idea of being past feeling in verse number 19, is such an interesting idea. It's describing unhealthy feeling. It's like the, the system of feeling that God created you with that should be healthy and can be very helpful. These Gentiles are at a point where they are walking in the vanity of their mind and, and they are not feeling in a healthy way. No, no as a matter of fact... It's similar to their conscience being defiled. They, they stopped feeling guilt. Even in so-called Christian circles, there, there are people saying, you should never feel any kind of guilt. You understand that guilt is actually a part of a healthy feeling. When you do something you shouldn't do, you should feel guilty for it. But the, the world, and, and sometimes even Christians, are promoting this idea of never feel guilty, never apologize for anything, never admit wrong. And what happens is you become so seared in your conscience that you get, you get past feeling, and then you just go ahead and give in to lasciviousness, and you work all uncleanness with greediness. And, and it's a mess. And that's where our culture is. And that's where many people are going, even professing Christians. And what's the issue? The issue and the answer is summed up in verse number 20 of Ephesians 4. You've not so learned Christ. He's the master of our feelings. 
We need, to, we need to recognize that he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. We need to understand that, that he bore our uh, griefs and he carried our sorrows. He knows all these things. Therefore, we submit to him. We want to learn Christ. And this idea of truth is mentioned in verse number 21. Of course, Jesus is the embodiment of truth. And so, because of who he is, we put off uh, that which is the, the former conversation, the old man, that which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. And verse 24, we put on the new man, which is after God, and it is created in righteousness and true holiness. And how does this shape up? Well, you're not going to be sinfully angry as verse 26 says. If you've learned Christ and you recognize that all you are feeling he felt, you're not going to let the sun go down upon your wrath. And you're not going to see somebody have something and you're going to feel like I want what they have and then steal it. No, you're not going to follow your feelings into, into, into thievery, which verse 28 explains. And you're not going to follow, your, if, you're, if you're submitting to Christ in relationship to your feelings, then no corrupt communication is going to proceed out of your mouth. Do you see how practical and helpful Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 really are? Especially as we look at what's going on in the wicked world around us. You're going to have a healthy, happy marriage if, you're, if your feelings are yielded to, to the Lord Jesus Christ because you're going to be submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. And, and wives are going to be what they should be and husbands are going to be uh, what they should be. Children are going to obey their parents. Oh, but I don't feel like obeying my parents. I feel like rebelling against my parents. All of it is right here. In a world that doesn't want to hear the gospel and sometimes you don't feel like preaching the gospel, you're called at the end of chapter 6 to just go ahead and open your mouth boldly, verse 19, and make known the mystery of the gospel. You speak boldly as you ought to speak, whether you feel like it or not. It's all very interesting. Your feelings can be a wonderful blessing, or your feelings can ruin you. And they need to be regulated, and the only way they can be regulated is if you saturate your soul with the God of the Bible. May God help us to do these things. Would you stand, please?